all loose items in the pouch in front of you. Have a safe and informative journey. Hello, I'm Nathan Hartman, and this is Dream Finders, a podcast about the creative culture of Disney theme parks. From the mountains of China to the plains of Kenya, and even Moscow's Red Square, filmmaker Jeff Blythe has pointed his camera at the natural wonders of the world. Well, more like cameras. Sometimes nine to be exact, as he's directed six Circle Vision films for Disney, including Portraits of Canada, Wonders of China, and The Timekeeper. Jeff chats with me about the technical struggles of shooting a full 360-degree image for Circle Vision, the time he filmed in Africa, the Disney feature Cheetah, and how you can find his work in both The Shining and Blade Runner. All of that and more is coming right up on DreamFinders. Jeff Blythe, welcome to DreamFinders. Hi, glad to be here. So let's start with the film you were an associate producer on uh, and a special effects supervisor as well. And it's one that is not Disney related, but something that I think a lot of people know, uh, which is 1976's To Fly, which opened Air and Space Museum uh, in D.C. and a place there to this day. Uh, in fact, it is known as the highest grossing documentary of all time before the release of Fahrenheit 9-11 in 2004. Tell us a little bit about your experience working for the company who created that film, uh, uh, McGilvery Freeman uh, Films, and how you f- how you found yourself working uh, with them on this project. Well, I had come out to California from Michigan um, in uh, 1975, and uh, like everybody that comes out hoping to break into the film business, you are confronted with, well, what are you going to do? And I had, I had done everything on a film except music. Every, every category of film you could do. I, I, you know, I had worked those jobs and I, I knew when I came out, I was going to have to pick something. I was going to be a cameraman. I was going to be an editor. I couldn't be both. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to be a writer, whatever. And, uh, When I first came out, I started interviewing, and uh, one of the first things that happened was a a couple of friends of mine that I had worked with back in Michigan, um, both independently said, you should go see McGillivray Freeman. And uh, so they they now both take credit for me getting the job, uh, even though, like I said, it was was independent. (laughs) Uh, I so I, I met up with these guys down in Laguna Beach. They were uh, Jim Freeman and, and Greg McGillivray were surf filmmakers. Uh, that was their background, but they were going to be branching out into something very big, which was an IMAX production. And IMAX was only about five years old at the time, and there were only one or two cameras that existed in the world. And uh, so they were going to do this bicentennial project, and they hired me as a production manager. But I also became associate producer. I also did special effects. I also did the wardrobe. I did uh, <laughs> a lot of the local casting. I was building props. It was, uh, you know, it was, I got to do everything. And it was like all of those, those, I, those notions of, of Hollywood, you know, mm. pick the one thing you're going to do and because you can't do everything. And it was like, well, wait a minute, I got to do everything. <laughs> so, I mean, I even shot some of the, there were, there's some scenes in there that, that, uh, that I shot. So it was, uh, I, in fact, I'm even in the film. There are two places. I'm the guy that gets the paint spilled on him when the balloon goes <laughs> past the church. That's me. Um, and I'm also on top of the stagecoach. Uh, for anybody familiar with the film, they'll remember the stagecoach racing against the the uh, the old steam train. Mm. And uh, so it was, you know, it was a little bit of everything. That was what we did for uh, with McGillivray Freeman. And what was interesting was that the film was supposed to just be there for the bicentennial. And um, Conoco, Continental Oil Company, uh, had sponsored it and, and putting up the budget for it was their contribution to the bicentennial. And the film just stuck around and kept playing for years and years. And Conoco was going – Hang on, what are we supposed to do with this money that's coming in? We weren't supposed to make money on the film. So it was a little bit of an embarrassment of riches for them. <laughs> so, as you mentioned, um, this was an IMAX film, and McGovery Freeman 
specializes uh, to this day in in giant screen IMAX documentary work, um, very much based on, I would say a lot of it, nature and world travel related. It's those, you know, if you've ever been to a museum, everybody, it's, it's, it's the ones that, you know, they're about the, you know, the polar bears or they're, you know, they're about, you know, flying is a great example about that, but very specific uh, and sometimes nature oriented material. Did you have interest in, in those subject matters as a kid? Were you always coming from Michigan, a, a nature kind of person? No, I was interested <laughs> in a job and, and this was the job that, that they had and, and, and I took it. I happen to have a, a you know, a wide uh, interest, uh, area of interest, but this was just coincidental in this particular case. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I threw myself into it. I had done some special effects before Greg and Jim had never done any special effects. And so I sort of became the default guy, the mm-hmm. go-to guy to, to do stuff. And, you know, we did, you know, they, they said, well, uh, in fact, I had done the budget for the film. And I kept saying, guys, there's no money for the space sequence at the end. And they kept saying, "Eh, we'll we'll find some money somewhere along the line. And when we got to the end of the film, there was there was very, very little money left to do a space sequence. Um, And so, you know, this was the dollar ninety eight version of of an (laughs) IMAX uh, space sequence. But, uh, you know, I built the spaceship that, that you see flying by. Um, I worked with a company called Graphic Films, and they, they had some uh, planetary models, and we were able to use their stage. But um, it really was done on the cheap. And, and it's still around to this day, believe it or not. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my question, though, is is if if it wasn't nature stuff that you were interested in film wise, what early film stuff really gravitated you towards the medium, uh, the medium of film, film or, yeah. or, or, or uh, OK, um, you know, I had I, I've been doing every kind of film you can think of over the years when I back in Michigan, I worked for a film company. We were doing commercials, documentaries, medical films, sales training films, um, you name it. Um, you know, anybody came to us with a film project, we worked on it. Um, we did new car announcement films for Oldsmobile. Um, just, you know, very, very, very wide ranging. And so, you know, I, I, I didn't have a one specific interest, one particular area that, that was attractive to me. I just, I enjoyed making movies. Hmm. Were there films that you thought uh, those are genres or anything like that that would interest you? Or were you always kind of in documentary in that way? No, you know, if you were to talk to me from back then uh, and said, you're going out to, you know, Hollywood, what kind of films are you going to make? Um, I was I was interested in a in a wide variety. But if somebody said you got to pick one, uh, probably. you know, thrillers, dramas, mm. that sort of thing. Okay. Um, of course, all of your work has allowed you to travel all over the world. Um, were you a traveler at a young age? I know you did spend some time in West Africa with the Peace Corps. Um, yes. Was, was, was that something um, that you always wanted to do? Or did you always have an itchy foot to get out and see the world? Um, you know, it wasn't so much that there was a particular place or regions that I wanted to go to. I just knew that I loved travel. Hmm. Um, uh, when I was um, young, we used to travel you know, as a family. Um, uh, by the time I was in college, I was traveling quite a bit. And so it was. It just seemed very natural to me that right after college, I would go off and uh, um, spend two years in West Africa in the Peace Corps. Yeah. Um, and really, ever since then, I've been doing a lot of traveling, and it's just become a part of who I am and what I do. And uh, um, always felt very, very comfortable doing it. So in 1979, um, or a little bit before that, of course, um, Stanley Kubrick ends up hiring McGilvery Freeman um, to shoot some of the iconic helicopter shots at the beginning of The Shining. Um, how did you end up being the helicopter cameraman for that? And did it just feel like, I mean, Kubrick had had films underneath his belt, but like this is one of those that has really stuck around in culture. Um, did it feel like anything special at the time or just another assignment? Um Actually, it did feel rather special at the time. Um, unfortunately, the way I got into helicopter photography was um, after the the death of Jim Freeman mm. in a helicopter accident. Um, right after the film To Fly, 
um, Jim and I were up in uh, the town of Bishop in, here in California, up in the high desert area um, near the Sierra Nevadas. And um, it, we were scouting locations for a uh, Kodak TV commercial. And uh, Jim was up with a couple of the agency people and uh, flying them around, showing them some sites. And, you know, they had a, an unfortunate, uh, tragic accident and two of them died. Um, and, it, it, you know, the company basically shut down for about six months, uh, just didn't even want to talk about work. Mm. And the first project that we had that came along that, that was of interest to uh, Greg McGillivray was – uh, we had done a bunch of commercials for uh, Thunderbird, and they had said, you guys interested in getting back into it? And we thought, yeah, sure, because we, we had done a lot of filming out in the desert, and it's, you know, car-to-car -car stuff and beauty shots and things like that. And it was like, yeah, but the first shot's going to be a helicopter shot. Mm. And they wanted a shot of the the emblem, the the hood ornament from a Thunderbird with a little piece of the hood flying through the clouds. And so we decided we were going to use the this helicopter belly mount that we had, and we mounted this with the camera right, you know, aimed at this so that you just fly through the clouds and it looks like the the front of the car is, you know, the, the, the hood ornament is is flying through the clouds. And and it fell to me just sort of by default. Are you willing to do this? Yeah, I think so. And boy, I didn't get a wink of sleep the night before. Mm. I was I was just 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 a ball of nerves. But did the shot, and from then on, you know, all these helicopter type projects came to us. Um, and that's that's how the shining came about. And uh, so it was, you know. A, a phone call from Kubrick that asked about, you know, would be interested in, in doing this. He had a unit that was working up in uh, Glacier National Park at the time, and they were shooting ground shots. And they had the little yellow Volkswagen with the Colorado license plates and were just filming, you know, passbys and so forth of, of the car on the ground. And he said he needed helicopter shots. Were we interested? And so we put together a team very quickly, and um, we brought a helicopter from L.A. and ferried it up to Montana. And we we spent the better part of a month shooting up there. Um, and it was it was a, a very very challenging for a number of reasons. Number one, Kubrick wanted the film to, sent back to London for developing, so we never saw any of the footage that we were shooting. We shot for a month and, and never saw any of the film. Oh, that's nerve wracking. <laughs> uh, very much so. And, you know, Kubrick is just not a, a director who gives you feedback. It's, you know, just keep doing what you're doing, you know? And it was like, okay, we'll just keep doing what we're doing. Um, and, and so there were some shots that got rehearsed Oh, boy, 40, 50, 60 times. And and then other shots that, that we probably only did, you know, a dozen times. But we had these like a menu and it was it would it would be depending on the weather. You know, the, the Glacier National Park is sort of divided by the, the mountains. Mm -hmm. There's stuff you could do on one side of the park if the weather was open. There's stuff you could do on the other side of the park if it was open. And, um, and, and for the longest time, we couldn't get over the mountains, the, the pass, Logan Pass is about, I don't know, nine or 10,000 feet. And, and we couldn't get over it because it was just wrapped in, in clouds. But we would do these shots and we'd say, okay, let's do, you know, like a number seven, because, you know, that area looks like it's open and we'd go off and, and practice. Greg McGillivray was driving the little yellow Volkswagen and we were only supposed to do the shots for Jack Nicholson going up for his interview, mm -hmm. which was the beginning of the film. And the idea in the story, and, and this was all planned out, the, the, unit, the unit that had been up there filming before us had also done a lot of ground shots of the Volkswagen with a trailer behind it. And this is supposed to be all of the the uh, uh, you know personal effects that 
Jack Nicholson and his family are bringing. Mm. And they had somebody doubling for Nicholson, somebody dub- doubling for Shelley Duvall, and someone for the little boy. And so they they had already shot a whole bunch of footage of the Volkswagen with the trailer going up in the mountains. But all of the helicopter photography was just the yellow Volkswagen, meaning for Nicholson's first trip to go up for the interview. And somewhere along the line, we didn't know about it until we saw the finished film, Kubrick decided to use three more shots from the helicopter footage for the family going up. Mm. And so there is no trailer. (laughs) They never used anything of the trailer. And so it created this kind of an odd situation in the movie where – there's all this luggage that there, there was no place to put it if you've got three people in a Volkswagen. Um, and yet, when he gets to the hotel, there's they've got all this stuff that they supposedly brought with them, which would have made sense had you still seen the trailer. Which, in, in retrospect, is, is sort of hilarious because, of course, if, if people who love The Shining know – conspiracy theories about the shining are about as uh, you know as, as thick oh, as it can get i mean there's amazing. everyone has some um for a movie that's been psychoanalyzed this is the most psychoanalyzed thing i've ever seen and mm-hmm. you know you've been sort of drug a little bit into the conspiracy theories as well because of a helicopter shadow um and and yep. none of it is intentional from from what i've read um but uh, did you find that interesting that the sort of psychoanalysis that went in um over the decades since the film has been released? Well, you know, it's it's interesting how people work backwards when they create these conspiracies. They they start from the finished product and say, okay, well, if we can see the shadow, it, you know, knowing Kubrick, it must have been intentional. And therefore, yeah. <laughs> let's 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 attribute some meaning to that, you know, rather than than looking at it and going, oops. Um <laughs> You know, it was the the, when let me explain a little bit about how that photography came about with the shadow in it. The cameras were shooting what we call full aperture, which is the the biggest frame of film that you can in 35 millimeter. I had two cameras mounted underneath the helicopter on on a plate that I could control and I couldn't see through those cameras. I could aim them, but I couldn't see through them. And the plate that they were sitting on, these two cameras, had a small video camera mounted between them that was aimed in the same direction. So I could use that to line up a shot, but it was kind of accurate, but not very. And the two lenses that we had on these two cameras were very dissimilar. One was a 16 millimeter lens, wide angle. The other was a 9.8 millimeter, which is very wide angle. And again, I can aim it, but I can't tell you what's exactly in the shot. Mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I would know through the video that I could see in the in the uh, in the you know the cockpit of the helicopter. I could see, yeah, we're aimed right at the the little yellow Volkswagen. It's in the middle of the shot. We're good. But beyond that, I couldn't tell you where our shadow was. And we didn't know until it showed up in the film. And I think one of the one of the reasons I you know, I, I read a rationale that, that Kubrick had for it, that he had originally planned to do a series of dissolves where, you know, one scene blending into another during that opening sequence. And that shadow would have been hidden mm-hmm. by the dissolve. And then somewhere along the line at the last minute, it was, wait a minute, no, let's just make them all straight cuts. And they did, and there's the shadow. Mm. Uh, and of course, something that's also sort of weird about this one sort of legendary, um, you know, helicopter set of footage is it ends up in Blade Runner as well. Not the cut most people see now, um, but the original studio cut that everyone seems to hate. Um, the good ending cut, as they say. Um, and uh, well, there's a there was a, a, a thing that we used to do when I would go off and do helicopter work for McGillivray Freeman. Um, I had a kind of carte blanche that at any time I could go off and, you know, grab a shot mm-hmm. that we would put into our stock film library. That makes sense. You're up there anyway. 
yeah, I'm up there and, uh, you know, I got a half a load of film. I'm just going to go off and find some pretty pictures, some nice angles, some nice light and, and grab some, grab some shots. And what happened was I did that at times on the shining, even though we didn't get to keep any of the film, it all went <laughs> back to Kubrick. It was like, I was doing some shots and there's no Volkswagen in it. And it was like all of the helicopter stuff we were shooting was supposed to have the Volkswagen in it. And it was like, mm, yeah, here's just a nice scenic. Oh, here's another, you know, here's a pretty shot. Oh, this would be fun. And so I would go off and grab shots and all of those were totally unrehearsed and, and because they were literally grab shots. Mm -hmm. And so some of that material is what, well, I mean, that is the material that is used in the end of uh, the first Blade Runner. And yeah, for people to, to have a better understanding, there are multiple variations on Blade Runner. Now that there's a sequel, what he means is they're the first edition the studio put out. I said uh, good earlier. I should have said happy because it's technically not very good. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the happy ending. And, and if you if you look for that cut, I don't even know if it's available. I, I think it's probably deep on one of the DVDs. Um, mm -hmm. It is it is. Harrison Ford and um, oh, I'm forgetting her name, but they they're going away and there's they're in their um, Rachel Rachel that's right and they're in their uh, speeder uh, flying away and it's kind of this happy shot um, and that's the footage. Did you I mean did you just did someone tell you like have you seen Blade Runner your footage is in it or who how do you find out that this weird thing had happened? Nobody told me. <laughs> uh, I. It, when the when the movie came out, I, you know, I was one of those people who was right at the front of the line to go see Blade Runner. And as this ending is playing out, I'm looking at this stuff thinking, you know, <laughs> this looks like Montana. This looks like Glacier National Park. And it's like, wait a minute. D did I shoot this? What's it doing in this movie? <laughs> Hmm. All, so that's I, how I found out all that work, all that extra stuff. And it actually paid off. Who would have thought? Um, yeah. Uh, 1982. So uh, Wonders of China is uh, for the Disney fans out there. This is the um, Epcot Center, one of the Epcot Center opening day films. Um, and it is this is an interesting thing, right? This is not a Disney made film. This is a commissioned film by Disney from a Gilvery Freeman. Um, did you remember getting pitched the project? I'm curious how. Um, you guys and McGilvery Freeman were sort of pitched Epcot Center and 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 the film that they wanted you to make. Well, uh, Greg McGilvery had a, a you know, pretty good reputation for the the large format IMAX movies at that time, and when he got the call from Disney uh, from Imagineering uh, to do the film, um, it, you know, I, I thought, well, there's a problem with the scheduling I, you know we, we can't do this because there's a big IMAX movie that we'd be making at the same time and Greg didn't bother to tell Disney that he just said no nah, don't worry about it you'll do the film <laughs> and I was like oh okay <laughs> um I you know you have to keep in mind your 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 listeners have to keep in mind that in you know 1980 when we got the phone call to do this um this was only uh, a few years after the end of the Cultural Revolution and, and uh, you know, after Nixon had been in China. And, and it was very rare to be able to, to get an invitation to go to China, to see China, to, to do anything outside of Beijing or Shanghai. And, and when you get there, it's like you've time traveled. It's, it's like America in 1950. Mm. Um, and, and that's about as modern as it was. Uh, you get out into the the countryside and you know you can add another you could subtract another 30 years it was very very primitive in in a lot of areas uh but we got this notice from disney and they said we have this book it's called china scenes and it was a picture book of beautiful areas of china um and most of these pictures were taken by still photographers who had you know waited you know six months for a shot uh, these were all in, you know, really beautiful areas um, under, you know, absolutely pristine, perfect conditions. And none of the pictures were labeled. Well, they were, but in Chinese. So I, <laughs> I couldn't read any of it. And when when we got the go ahead, they just said, here, here's a book of pictures. Try to make this into a movie. <laughs> and 
that was it. That was the, that was the, that was our, you know, marching orders. Try to make this into a movie and, and oh, and by the way, do it in 360 degrees. So, um, it was, uh, it was very much a challenge. It's the kind of thing that, you know, today, um, you know, you'd spend a couple of days on the internet, you know, Google search, street view, whatever, and you'd nail all this stuff. You'd know where everything was. And for me, it was like, I, I don't I don't know where any of this stuff is. Mm -hmm. I have to start, you know, learning where everything is in China. And I I went to Chinatown and I and I bought all kinds of books that were both English and Chinese. Not that there were that many. And I bought every postcard they had because they had all these postcards from all over China and they would they were labeled on the back as to where they were in English. Mm. And so I put together a, a, a photo album. Actually, it was three photo albums with a total of 150 locations. And then we, uh, you know, I went off to China with, uh, it was myself, um, Bob Jabot, who was the vice president of studio operations, and Randy Bright, who was the um, uh, creative director for all the films that played at Epcot. It was just the three of us, and we negotiated with the Chinese for a week um, to get these locations. And it was uh, it was a struggle because they didn't know anything about 360. They just thought, we can't let you anywhere near a military base or anything we call strategic. And and I realized very quickly that, that anything that they defined as strategic was stuff that I was interested in <laughs> taking pictures of. And so – um, but you know, we wore them down over time. Um, there was a, there was one, one particular incident. I mean, they, they said, you know, strategic things would be like bridges or, uh, railroads or, um, tunnels. And the reason they were strategic is that in those days they were petrified that the Russians were going to come marching over the border at any time. And so they took military bases and they moved them way out in the countryside and they picked the most beautiful places <laughs> to stick military bases or power plants or, you know, the ugliest infrastructure you can imagine. And so traveling through China was was very, very frustrating because if you're making a regular movie – you could say, well, I, I'll set up here and I'll I'll aim my camera this way and I won't see the power plant. And I'll, I'll just see this beautiful view. Well, that doesn't work in 360 degrees. Yeah. And so I lost so many locations that were beautiful but just couldn't make it work in 360. Yeah, it looks great on a postcard until you look behind you. And then it's – yeah, that's a problem. Um, exactly. The – I'm curious about Circle Vision in the format because this is a Disney, I believe, I'm by the patented Disney product, and right. you are sort of literally, it seems, kind of dropped into the project. Like, go do this thing, go to you know, uh, take care of the red tape to get to China, and then also like learn how to use Circle Vision. What was your process of? Was it overwhelming or was it a fun challenge? Did you have? Did you go and and see America the Beautiful or what did you do to try to get your mind around Circle Vision? Uh, well, the first thing I did was I went to Disneyland, uh, where America the Beautiful was playing, and I watched it four or five times in a row. Um, and you know, I, I told the the host, I said, "Look, don't tell me to leave. I'm gonna, <laughs> you know, I'm gonna have to run around and get back in line. I, I, I'm just gonna sit here in the middle of the theater and I'm gonna watch this over and over and over again." I said, "Okay, fine." So I did, and uh, it was that was my learning process was to figure out. What are they doing? How did they do it? Why aren't they doing it this way? And it became a process where, for example, one of the things that I learned was uh, there was a shot in America the Beautiful of a cattle drive. And most of the shots that are in that film that, that weren't aerials were done from the roof of a station wagon. Mm. And they had a station wagon that was kind of maneuvering through or a slowly moving herd of cattle. And the shot was done at a time when the sun was fairly low, uh, which was kind of unique. They didn't do that very often. And it wasn't until about the third time I'm watching this and I'm, I'm sort of keeping an eye on the sun angle and I'm doing the math in my head and I'm going, if the sun is in the shot – that means the shadow of the camera should be right back here. And I turned and I looked and in the back panels, 
I could see the shadow of the camera. And that was my introduction to the circle vision camera. I saw it as a shadow <laughs> and it was like, oh, now I get it. I, I could see the shape of it and I realized, oh, these, you know, these have to be the mirrors and the camera. You know, got it. And that was, uh, that was my introduction. That was the, the part that, that told me how this system worked. And after that, the, the biggest learning curve was on location in the first couple of months in China, scouting for locations. Um, you know, trying to find where to place the camera. And what I was finding was the number of places. You, I mean, first of all, you, you would think it's a camera that sees in 360 degrees. Boy, you could put that any place that, you know, where there's a pretty scenery. And it's like, no, you can't. Because it, think of it like a lighthouse and you've got this beam of light that comes out of the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. If you're too close to the lighthouse, that light's never going to get to you. If you're above the lighthouse, the light doesn't get to you. Well, the camera is seeing 360 degrees, but it's this narrow band that's only 30 degrees tall, wide, mm -hmm. or, you know, from, from top to bottom. And so... If it's not within that band, you're not going to see it. Well, that's why we crawl around on our hands and knees underneath the camera. You can't see us. There have been times in, in some of the films when the only place I could get was to stand on top of the camera. Um, but the, the point is that you're trying to do this and keep everything level. That means you've, you've got to have that, that area that you can see. Um, everything needs to fit within it. You can't sort of say, well, yeah, but that's kind of down a hill. There's a beautiful pagoda there, but you know, we can't just tilt that camera down. You'd have to tilt all the cameras down. And then now you've got this really screwy image. And so you're trying to keep everything horizontal, but trying to find locations where everything fits within that horizontal plane was very difficult. That was that was a steep part of the learning curve. So, did the learning curve get easier when you when you started working on Portraits of Canada? Canada, which is <clears throat> for people who don't know, Portraits of Canada was for Expo eighty six in Vancouver. It's produced by Disney, um, and this was this was not a part of McGilvery Freeman, correct? This was you working for right. Disney uh, on the project. Uh, doing the second one, did were there things that you had learned? That was actually that was actually the third one. Okay, what was the second one? The second one was The Eternal Sea, Correct. which was for Tokyo Disneyland. And that one was filmed with the same camera, but instead of nine, we used five. So it was only a 200-degree show. It was, it's like the, like the French film, mm -hmm. uh, a sit-down theater, 200 degrees. Um, and that one was very liberating – compared to doing 360 degrees. You could hide, you know. <laughs> well, uh, you know, you, you've got all the boxes of equipment that the camera comes in, boxes and boxes and boxes. And so a typical circle vision shot, you have you drive to the location with an equipment truck, you take off all, the, all these boxes, you unload all the boxes, you assemble the camera, you take all the boxes, put them back in the truck, drive the truck sometimes a long ways mm -hmm. to get out of the shot. You get all extraneous people out of the shot. You do the shot, you bring everything back, and you, you have to haul all that stuff off the truck, load the boxes back on the truck to go go away. And with a 200-degree show, you basically just say, put the boxes here. We'll never see it. Yeah. And so it, you could – you know, easily do multiple shots per day, whereas a typical circle vision show, uh, you're lucky to get one shot a day. Mm -hmm. Was Eternal Sea part of McGilvery Freeman, uh, like another film kind of in connection with Disney, or was that Disney's first no. for you? No. Uh, the Wonders of China was this was the split. It's when Got I it. left McGillivray Freeman. Um, halfway through that show, I became an independent filmmaker, and I finished Wonders of China, and then all the films I did for Disney after that were, you know, um, on my own. Gotcha. Yeah. So you end up going from 200, which is a little easier, and they drag you, you know, there's a classic phrase from Godfather uh, Part 3, every time I think I'm out, they pull me right back in. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you're doing Portraits of Canada, which is Expo 86 in Vancouver. Um, right. Do do you end up um, 
well, one of the things I want to mention here, which is something that I had to reach out for you uh, for in my research, is I think a glaring error by many people, um, even D23 uh, and what they have. Um, Portraits of Canada has nothing to do with the original O Canada film at Epcot. Um, how did the confusion happen? I mean, I know even even Disney seems to not be able to get this right when it comes to their images they use to talk about Portraits of Canada. You know, I'm I'm not sure where that that problem came from. Um, you know, when I first started doing these films, um, like Wonders of China, you know, there really wasn't an internet. Mm-hmm. There, you know, there were there weren't home computers, there weren't websites. The you know, none of that kind of uh, follow on activity that allows people to get, you know, the the that kind of rich experience that that adds to just seeing the film. And in the case of um, Portraits of Canada, um, which was made in 85 for 86, uh, uh, for, you know, premiere in, in 86, mm-hmm. um, again, this was still, you know, very, very early on. We're only, a, you know, a year and a half after the classic Mac. So um, everything was still pretty primitive. We did we did some, some uh, shots in... Uh, portraits of Canada that are um, done in the computer. Mm. Uh, you know, we had some visual effects that were done in the computer. And in those days, if you needed to do any kind of visual effects, you you actually used a supercomputer. Um, and and there were only a few of those. And uh, it was it was a huge huge deal to uh, to do anything in the computer. And uh, the, the Cray supercomputer has a as a, a cooling unit the size of a box car. Yeah. I mean, you know, this was massive. Um, so it was, it was huge to be able to do visual effects in, um, a circle vision format, which we did in, in, um, uh, portraits of Canada. So that, that's an advancement. And, and, and I think what's interesting is you have, um, whereas it, uh, circle vision sort of starts, you end up doing a lot of the progression and we'll talk a little bit about that in timekeeper, um, the progression of trying things and doing things a little different and sort of moving the medium of circle vision. Um, what, when it came to portraits of Canada, d- did you find that there were certain things beyond just having experience have done, have having done circle vision, were there things that you felt felt were smoother? Um, even like technical things that you realized, well, if we do it this way, it'll make our process quicker was there anything like that that you learned um yes and no the there there were things like um i mean every one of the circle vision films that i did i felt like we are we're going to tear up the envelope and make a new envelope we're just going to keep pushing way beyond whatever's been done before i didn't want to make a film that was as simple as america the beautiful Mm -hmm. when i did wonders of china Uh, so there were advances and things that we did in that that had never been done before in circle vision and each of the films in in you know through uh, through a progression of the films that I've worked on, we tried to, uh, you know, make advances. Uh, so the, there were things that were uh, considerably easier uh, by the time we got to Portraits of Canada. Um, but at the same time, because we were trying to do new and different things, we were, re- you know, we were making some things easier, but then there were other things that were just really, really tough to pull off. Um and you know, uh, uh, here's an example. Um, when w- in in Portraits of Canada, there's a sequence that we did following a ballerina with the uh, National Ball- Ballet of Canada. And you know, we filmed in the rehearsal halls, and you know, um, we filmed in the you know backstage at the O'Keefe Center in Toronto. But we also filmed on stage during a real ballet performance in front of an audience, um, which hadn't been done before. Uh, but we had a, a, a newer type of dolly for, for the camera, which made our life much, much easier to be able to, to, to get a dolly shot there. But also I had had a, a pan head built for the camera so that I could rotate the whole 360 degree camera from my position underneath. I could, there was a crank that I could turn to rotate the camera to follow somebody. I had video taps. They weren't a hundred percent accurate, but they were close enough to be able to know where the framing was. 
So I had these kinds of advances, but we were also trying to pull off something that was really, really tough to do, which was in the middle of a performance, get a shot. Um, and uh, we had, we, you know, we had a chance to rehearse that and, and, and everybody knew what their jobs were. And what the way we did it was um, we had a, uh, an opportunity to to get out on the stage and and set everything up, and then be prepared for a performance that night. And the there was an announcement made to the theater audience that we would be doing some filming that night. And what we did was, um, I picked a scene that was part of the first scene of the second act uh, from the ballet La Sylphide. And what we did was. After the intermission, the audience came back, lights go down, curtain opens, and they did part of that first scene for us, the, the part that we were filming, and then we stopped, uh, and then the curtains closed, and then the show went back on mm -hmm. again, and they did the same scene over again. But but it was, we got it, but it, it and it looks like a real performance, and it's run in front of an audience. We did a similar thing for America, the American Journeys, where uh, we filmed at Dodger Stadium. And it was the same sort of a setup of we filmed it between two games of a doubleheader. Remember those. <laughs> um, and, and so we – but the only way we could do it was we had to have our own teams. So we got a bunch. We got a bunch of guys who were minor league players and put them in Dodger uniforms. And I think it was the Philadelphia Phillies they were playing that day. Um, and so we hit. Oh, this this took. You know what I'm describing took three months of negotiations to to arrange. But the idea was between the games, we got the field and we got the field for you know ten minutes, and we could go out had had it all rehearsed had to plan, roll the camera out there, grab the shots. And, and it was funny when we were, when we were doing the scene, um, I had two camera positions that I wasn't sure which one was going to be best, but we had a re a set play and a uh, runner on first base. The pitcher throws to first base to get the runner back. Then he throws home swing and a miss and the runner steals second with a throw down. That was it. That was very simple, but we'd rehearsed it. We'd, We'd practiced it. We knew what we were going to do. So we're filming, and there's a public address announcer who says, you know, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're all going to take part today in the filming of a new scene for Disneyland, you know, whatever. So he gives this prepared speech, and uh, he said, <laughs> I remember he said, just respond the way you normally would to the Dodgers. <laughs> it was like the, the Dodgers weren't doing very well that year. <laughs> anyway, so we we filmed the scene, and the audience in the, I mean the stadium full of people, they react, but not very spirited. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, get everybody back to one, you know, and all the uh, players are all going back to where they're ready to go. And I've got a bullhorn, and I announced, okay, here we go. Here we go. Take two. And they do it again. And the audience kind of gets into it this time. And it was like, we, you know, they were, they were kind of spirited. And so we did the third take. And by that time, you thought it was the, you know, last game of the World <laughs> Series. They were going nuts. But they finally understood what it was we were doing. Um, so... A lot of these films, of course, people have to go uh, or had to go to one of the theme parks to see. But let's talk about a film that they can watch right now on Disney Plus, and that's 1989's Cheetah. Um, a, a film that I should mention beats The Lion King to the phrase Akuna Matata by five years. Um, <laughs> as a film, it showcases the African plains. It takes place uh, in Africa. How did you get attached to the project? Was it because of your uh, relationship with the Disney company at the time? How, what was the process of you getting, where you pitched the film or how did it happen? Um, I had, um, by this time, um, an agent, um, a, what we call in the business, a boutique agency, um, meaning, you know, like a dozen clients. Uh, and my agent happened to have lunch with an executive from Disney. 
um, just sort of, you know, working the, working the suppliers, mm-hmm. you know? And, um, and she said that this guy had said, we're trying to find somebody to direct this film in Africa and uh, we haven't been able to find the right person yet. And she said, well, I got just the client for you. And as it turns out that afternoon, I was on the Disney lot screening a film that was, uh, I was screening a, a finished print of a film that I did for uh, the Disney MGM studio tours. It was a film that was going to be um, at the preview center. Oh, know, okay. Yeah. Promoting what the Disney MGM experience was going to be like. And I had, it, it was a big production and, uh, you know, it was, and it was a lot of fun, but it, like I said, it was a, it was a big deal show and I happened to be screening the thing. And, and so I'm, I'm in a, in an upstairs screening room at Disney in the old animation building. And, um, I'm, I'm watching the film by myself. I'm basically just checking it for the color and accuracy and the sound. And this guy sticks his head in. And he looks at the screen and he watches maybe 20 seconds of the thing and turns to me and says, come see me when you're done. I'm down the hall. I was like, okay. <laughs> Don't know what that's about. I didn't know anything about the lunch or anything. And I go down and, and meet with this guy afterwards. And that 20 seconds was enough for him to go, yeah, okay, this guy's <laughs> qualified to make the film that we want. Because I had, you know, I had actors like Danny DeVito and Bette Midler in the in this preview film. So um, he, you know, he sits down and he says, here's the good news. We want you to direct this film in Africa. And I'm going, okay, what's the, <laughs> what, what's the bad news? And he says, well, when Disney does a film, a feature film, they have what they called their standard 13 week countdown. And what that means is 13 weeks from the start of photography, you've got a director on board, you got the producer on board. Um, you know, by week 10, you've, you've got most of your cast lined up and, and so forth. And you, you hire the director of photography in week six or whatever the countdown is coming to the, to the uh, start of production. And, and he said, so the bad news is we're coming up on week 10. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. Um, and so it was like, you know, once we signed a contract, it was get on a plane and go find locations and work with the writer and 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 help them rewrite it. And I, I was told by the, the the executive who was on the show, he said I had he knew of my writing. I had written a screenplay that took place in Africa. He knew that I had spent years in Africa. Um, and that had a lot to do with it. He said, look, you're going to be working without a net. Um, you're going to have to be making decisions on the spot. Um, and we know that, you know, based on what you've done before, you know, in, in crazy places like China, um, that you come back with material that we make into a film. So that was it. It was, um, it was, it was not just the filmmaking background. It was also the travel experience and, and, uh, um, and, you know, by this time I had a pretty good love of Africa and, um, I think it showed. So what I think is also interesting about this film is at least on IMDb, uh, Roy Disney himself is named as a producer. Was, was that more of an administrative role or did he have like direct involvement? Uh, he was a uh, executive producer and I had, two meetings with him, um, in his office, which is, uh, you know, for somebody who, who didn't get to meet Walt Disney, that's about as close as you can get to the original DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, in the right light and just, just certain phrases, things he would say, it was like, wow, this feels <laughs> about as close as you can get to talking to Walt himself. And, um, you know, Roy was a wonderful guy. Um, and quite a filmmaker. He had shelves and shelves of movies that he had made that nobody knows about because it was like that was part of his thing. It was almost like a hobby for him. Mm-hmm. 
And uh, he did not take much of an involvement. I mean, he was there. He uh, not on location. He, he was at the studio. He was a kind of a champion. And, um, you know, we can always use those. Especially when the name's Disney. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it definitely carries more weight than, you know, uh, some, you know, uh, you know, studio executive yeah. who, who's still wet behind the ears. <laughs> Well, something I want to ask about Cheetah, of course, is they always say you shouldn't work for children or work with children or animals. And you decided to do both. Um, what challenges came with shooting a, a film that is very much a story of of children and animals? Oh, boy. <laughs> you're you're picking at the scabs here. Uh, it was a it was a. A, a very painful process. Um, you know, we we had uh, 30 days to shoot the film. Um, probably the biggest single problem was that we never had a baby cheetah. Um, it was uh, promised to me from the very beginning by Robert Halmy Sr., who was the, the you know, actual hands-on producer of the show. And he kept saying, we've got two great adult cheetahs that, that are, you know, gentle and you'll be able to work with them. Um, but the baby cheetah, we're still hoping we'll get you one before the end of the filming. Uh, and so that was, that was awful, you know, to, to come home after 30 days and the only cheetah, baby cheetah that he had uh, been able to deliver was more like a teenager and it had not been trained. And the training staff told me, they said, you can't go anywhere near the cage that this is in. <laughs> Or it will hurt itself because it'll throw itself at the cage trying to get at you. Um, and it was just – it was a vicious wild animal. Mm -hmm. Whereas the the two main cheetahs that we used were um, very gentle. Um, you had, I mean there was all kinds of precautions that you had to use in filming around them. And you, you could never make them feel like they were boxed in. Uh, cats like this have um, claws that do not retract which means if they swipe at you, it's going to leave multiple marks. Um, so, you uh, you know, we had to be very, very careful, no, nothing distracting. And, and, you know, that being said, everything distracts a cheetah. <laughs> uh, it could be, you know, a leaf on a tree that's 50 yards away that's just fluttering in, in a breeze. And, and it's suddenly it's like, what's that? Oh, that looks interesting. Yeah, and and you've lost them, you know. Um, it could be, you know, little Morogo, the boy in the in the film, he had a, a Maasai outfit which had a cloth robe that was that would sort of move about in the breeze. And it was like, you've got to be careful where you put him relative to the cat so that that doesn't distract the cat. Um, you know, just just lots of things like that. But then on top of that, there were there were crew issues, as there always are on every film. Um, and I was forced to use uh, someone as a, a director of photography that, I, that wasn't my first, second, or third choice, mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't get along. And you know, I mean, that's the bottom line, and that's very, very difficult on a film like this where you're trying to move very quickly and um, I, he did something on the very first day of production that, that just made my job three times harder. He got rid of the zoom lens that we were planning to use. And your listeners have to, you should understand a zoom lens is very, very rarely used to make an actual zoom. What it's used for is think of it as a multiple uh, or variable focal length lens. Mm -hmm. And what that means is if you're not using a zoom, you're using fixed lenses, which means your choices are, you know, well, we can shoot this on the 50 millimeter. Uh, the next longest lens up would be the 85 millimeter, or we can go to the 125. And it's like, yeah, but, but to do this shot from where we are, I, I, I really need to be like at 63 millimeters. Right. And then at the end of the shot, I want to be at, you know, 47 millimeters. And, and so that's what you use a zoom lens for is you're constantly, you, you, an audience doesn't see it. They're not aware of it, but you're constantly shifting the focal length a little bit in, out, whatever, uh, to just to tweak the, the, the composition. So 
that went away just unilaterally no no questions you know asked it just Oof. Uh, the director of photography just made it go away second thing he took away was my video i had no video for the filming and you know as as i'm sure your your listeners know you watch any behind the scenes everybody gathers around at what they call the video village and and look at you know multiple video screens that show what the camera just took and you know the actors will do a scene and come back and look at the watch it and the director will say you know more of this less of that i had no video he sent it home and the reason he sent the the, the whole thing home was he said uh, that he had talked to the producer, was again, Halmy, and uh, Halmy wasn't going to hire anybody else for the crew, and so therefore there wouldn't be somebody to take care of the video equipment. And I said, I would have personally taken care <laughs> yeah. of the video equipment. It was my eyes. Uh, you know, it was uh, – I, I didn't get to see anything of what we were shooting for two weeks. <sighs> That's how long it would take for us to shoot footage, send it back to the studio for the video. You know, they'd, they'd make a videotape. They'd send it to us on safari camp in Kenya. And, you know, we're, we're living in tents. And we would only have electricity until about 10 o'clock at night when they'd shut the generator down. And the generator wasn't very accurate for, for uh, voltage, which meant... I'm trying to watch video dailies and it's kind of going in and out and the colors would drift away and, and it was awful. And, and you know, what are you going to do? It's two weeks later yeah. too. Um, now this is of course now on Disney plus for everyone to see. Is it one of those movies you look back on and you're like, Hey, I'm glad it's out there still. Or is it one of those from what hearing the experience yeah. sometimes I know this from personal experience, you're like, you know what? I, it's fine if it just stays in the in in the Disney vault. Like, what are your in, like <laughs> end feelings now that it's well, back out in the world? Sure. Uh, well, first I have to tell you, there was a um, they Disney sent out what they call an electronic press kit. That's the EPK mm-hmm. team, and they come out to location. They have somebody interview cast and and crew, um, and it's you know for the vaults. And they picked a particularly bad day to interview me. Um, it, things had not gone all that well. It's midway through the shoot, and and they sent this chirpy little Disney gal who was <laughs> so excited that she was, we're on location in Africa, you know, and and it was like, yes, we are, and and she said, so, tell me. What's it like? Is it anything like you'd hoped it would be directing a movie in Africa? And I said, uh, and you know, I'm I'm needed on the set, but I don't say that. I, you know, I, I, we're we're making room to. You got to do the publicity. So I thought about it for a second, and I said, you know, it's a little bit like water skiing from in front of the boat. <laughs> You you went out hoping to have a good time, and now you're just hoping the damn thing doesn't, you know, ride right over the top of you. And she said, well, thank you so much. You probably need to get back to set now, don't you? So that was it. That was my one little comment at, at the time. But, uh, you know, everybody says that. I mean, you know, Francois Truffaut used to say that, you know, it was like uh, uh, a stagecoach ride. That, you know, when you get on the stagecoach in St. Louis, you know, everybody has great hopes for making it all the way to the West Coast and, and uh, you know, all the dreams and, and hopes. And and then, you know, you just, you get attacked by Indians and you're starving and, you know, all, you know, it snows and all the things that can go wrong. And you're just hoping to survive by the end. Hmm. And so that's that's what the experience was at the time. And, and so for a long time, I was... Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to watch the film, didn't want to have anything to do with it, didn't really talk about it much. And then recently, um, when Disney was, you know, preparing for Disney Plus, they said, hey, we decided we're going to make a new, you know, print of, of the show or, you know, a digital print uh, in 4K. And um, we'd like you to, you know, be involved in the color correction and, and whatever. And I thought... Yeah, sure. Okay, I'll do that. But, you know, I, I was, to be perfectly honest, I kept thinking, 
oh my God, they're going to make me watch my movie. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, filmmakers just, we only see the mistakes we made, you know. We, Truly, yeah. I, I sat down and watched it with them and, and, you know, we were trading stories about production and whatever, but, and, and I'm watching the color correction and, and at the end, you know, I thought, you know, that's not a bad movie, <laughs> uh, you know, under the circumstances, uh, all the things that went wrong, um, it's a fun little film and, you know, it was, it was, I mean, you know, it was a G rated movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, uh, and I think G rated audiences, uh, enjoyed it. Um, and, and to this day, I, you know, I still get comments from people, you know, thanking me for the film. So you, you know, you just, these things live beyond us and you just, you put them out there in the world and, and hope they thrive. Speaking of a thing that is technically gone, but still continues to thrive in many ways is, uh, the timekeeper, um, uh, which you did uh, for 1992. You did uh, this film for Paris. Um, and then, of course, it's also been shown in Tokyo and, and also here in America at the Magic Kingdom. And um, for anyone who's interested and want to hear a ton more about uh, The Timekeeper, um, you did an excellent episode of the Retro WDW podcast all about production. And I highly recommend that for people. Um, one thing I am interested, though, uh, about um, – the whole process of timekeeper and creating narrative and circle vision and all that is because it is in three different areas, right? We're, and each of course is dubbed for a language of the country. And, and there's not a lot of shots in the film that have, uh, lips in them. And then of course, um, you know, when you have Jeremy Irons on screen, he speaks in English and things of that nature. W was that always the plan to deliver a film for a global audience or were you filming it with the idea of just the parents, the Paris audience in mind, and then it expanded from there? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, when we did um, that show, which was called From Time to Time for um, for Euro Disneyland, <laughs> um, before Disneyland Paris, um, we actually shot everything uh, dual language, mm. French and English. So – you know, those that were French speakers spoke French um, for, you know, for for their take, for their part of it. Um, but we also did, you know, uh, dual shooting, French and English. Uh, and when it came to the ending of the film, we knew that the um, – audience member that's supposedly you know the the family that is taken by timekeeper and sent to the future mm -hmm. um we knew that that had to work for both for paris and for tokyo disneyland mm -hmm. and so the concession that we made was we tried to cast those characters as people that would could pass for you know is that somebody that looks Asian? Maybe, <laughs> you know, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was this idea of, of being, trying to s split the difference, mm -hmm. you know, no blondes yeah. <laughs> were selected, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it was, there was, there was quite a bit of discussion about how to handle multiple languages in that film. And one of the discussions had to do with Star Wars. Hmm. Because it's the it's what we call the the C three PO um, solution, and the idea in that is in Star Wars, R two D two says you know beep 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 boop 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 whatever, and C three PO says what do you mean you've lost the Death Star plans? Right. That was a solution of. Yeah, one person speaks in one language and the other person responds in another. And so that was that was considered um, for some circumstances in the show as a way to just deal with it. Um, you know, when when I did Wonders of China, I had somebody on camera talking the you know, the, the Chinese poet mm -hmm. Li Po. And so right from the very first Circle Vision film, I had people talking on camera. Um, and, you know, Portraits of Canada has many people talking on camera. Um, and so we were dealing with that all the way, you know, since the very beginning. We've been dealing with how to handle that within the Circle Vision format. Um, 
and you know there was a there was an issue with the very first scene of the very you know of of wonders of china uh, in terms of what we were shooting uh li po is what he's known in the west he's a real person a real you know tang dynasty poet mm -hmm. from 1200 years ago um and so to put him in the film he introduces himself and in the film he says i'm li bai because that's his real Chinese mm -hmm. name, but in the in in the West he's known as Li Po. So all the publicity materials refer to Li Po. If you listen to the hostess at the beginning of the show, she talks about Li Po, but on screen he calls himself by his real name. <laughs> I'm Li Bai. Um, uh, an interesting thing uh, dealing in international uh, sort of relations about uh, Timekeeper is Gerard Depot Du was cameos in the Paris cut of the film. And he mentions, uh, interestingly enough, in, in a documentary uh, that I found uh, about the making of the film, and, and someone translated it, thank goodness, because half of it's in French, um, that he was offered mm -hmm. the part uh, from uh, J Jeffrey Katzenberg himself offered him the part, and he said, sure, I'll do it. So my question is, is this is made sort of at the zenith of the Eisner Wells Katzenberg time with the company. And you had made Wonders right. of China before Eisner had arrived. And I'm just really curious. Everyone has interesting like feelings about sort of that crux of time um, making stuff when they used to make it sort of in the Miller era. And now they're making it in the Eisner Wells Katzenberg sort of. I Did it feel different? Was it was it a different sort of vibe when making this production opposed to when you made stuff before they had joined the company? Uh, in a word, yes, um, and and part of that is is a kind of a evolution of the studio itself mm. and and the studio's approach to filmmaking. Um, when I made Wonders of China, um, I had a meeting with Ron Miller. Uh, I was asked to give him a quick pitch of the, you know, what I had in sure. mind, and and it was, hey, I got a book of pictures. I'm. I'm <laughs> Going to put together a movie about China. I was like, "Oh, okay, great. Have a good time." <laughs> um, and 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 for two years, there was not a word out of the studio about, "Hey, we're you know, let's talk about the direction of the film, or let's talk about the narration, or where this is going, or whatever." And it was like nobody, you know, stepped forward right. to to offer any you know so much as a suggestion. And it was like. That was the film. Hmm. And and it was like it was, you know, I, I hate to say it because it, it sounds like I'm bragging and it's more like I'm still dumbfounded that, <laughs> you know, 40 years later, it's my vision of China. Hmm. It was where I went and where I decided to put the camera and the words that I decided to put on the screen, you know, in the in the narration and in the mouth of Li Po. Um, so, it, 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 you know, you couldn't possibly do that today yeah i can't fathom disney having no production notes for somebody <laughs> these days oh my god they'd, <laughs> uh, you know the, there would be battalions of studio executives that would try to embed themselves into the film crew and you know you'd be shooing them away to get them out of the 360 shot um but you know every single choice would be subject to committees um and so at, I see. I'm trying to remember. I think Katzenberg and Eisner came in when I was in the middle of Portraits of Canada, and they came in and and basically when when you know someone new comes into the studio, they they review everything. Mm -hmm. You know what's in the pipeline. What you know what projects had been uh, you know um, approved by their predecessors. Um, and, you know, what's about to be right. finished, what's in the middle of shooting, what's in post-production, what's still on the boards. And and basically, I kept waiting and waiting, you know, it, you know for them to come yeah. and say, okay, show us what you've got. And for those who don't know, just a quick history lesson, like you, you go from a Ron Miller era where Ron Miller was the – the son-in-law of Walt Disney. He, you know, he's a great, uh, seems to be a wonderful guy and kind of businessy, yep. but you know, he's part of the Disney family to these two gentlemen who are 
uh, like the pinnacle of Paramount Pictures when they enter Disney. So when when he means like reviewing films, like these two gentlemen actually have notes and things to say <laughs> that are like oh, yeah. they are executives opposed to say uh, Ron Miller. So just a little history lesson for those right. who don't know. Yeah, uh, and and you know they were they were killing some projects that just you know they you know that were early enough in the works uh, where they would just say nah we're not going to make that movie and and it would just go away. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I had no idea what they were going to say, what they were going to do. And, and finally, at one point I, I called Katzenberg's office and I just said, I, you know, I just need to know, are you going to come and see the film? Are you going to, you know, whatever. And I got a, a lovely note from, from Jeffrey who said, you know, he said, we know who you are. We know the work that you've done. We're good. Mm. Just finish your film. So that was as close as that got. But then after that. Um, you know, projects like uh, the Timekeeper show, that was, you know, now we were into an era when studio executives wanted to be in on everything, all decisions. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a, you know, a reference point here. When when I did Wonders of China, I would take photographs in, you know, just, you know, snap, snap, snap in a in a circle. And I would then take those prints and just scotch tape them together. And these those became my reference for locations that I had surveyed. So that, you know, it was for me and and maybe my crew or, you know, talking to the Chinese and saying, I need to put something here or whatever. Um, it's just a visual reference, like a storyboard. By the time we were doing Timekeeper, it wasn't enough that we had those kinds of 360 degree photographs. If we were going to be bringing, well, almost all the scenes, we we were bringing in a great deal of art direction and mm-hmm. and and you know building sets and adding on and and you know like there's a big battle scene between the 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 British and the and, and the the Scots, the English and the Scots at at uh, a castle in Northumberland. And I you know I had these 360 photographs that we had taken on the survey and it was like okay, now we need to have an artist come in and draw all the people that are going to be in the shot fighting. And you know it was like this gigantic gap. Mm in imagination it was like seriously you can't picture in your mind that there's going to be a battle scene here is like you really need to have it all spelled out for you but that was you know that's filmmaking in the in the big studio Mm. era what was wild too about uh what i think is so funny is like um timekeeper has all of these shots that are see like aren't in the U.S. version that a lot of people know. And one of those is you go to Red Square. You go to Russia and you go to Red Square, uh, which I imagine was this great challenge that the entire North American audience didn't really even know happened. What was that experience like? I feel like, you know, you you do all this red tape for China and then now you're you're now literally going to go in the middle of Red Square and uh, talk about a sensitive area area to film at, I'm sure. Yes. And and one of one of my my the great pinnacles of my career as a director was the scouting of Red Square. I had asked to see Red Square at night and preferably lit up because there's there's quite a bit of lighting that they've got built into it. And we were scouting locations, hadn't started shooting the film yet. And it was, you know, we, we came to Moscow and they said, you need to jump in the car right now. There's a, a military guy. He's going to take you to Red Square. And it was like, cool. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm in a in a little hotel across from uh, Dzerzhinsky Square, which anybody who's read spy novels and whatever knows the stuff that goes on in the basement of of this building on Dzerzhinsky Square. It's like, you know, it's it's like CIA and FBI and all that rolled into one. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this guy in a in a classic Russian military outfit comes to get me at the hotel, throws me in this black, you know, limousine, whisks me off to 
the back of in behind. It's not the Kremlin. You know, the, let me let me paint a picture for you. You get the massive red square, and on one side is the Kremlin. On the other side is the Goom department store, G U M uh, department store, and it, it's it's as big as the Kremlin is on, in terms of the front. And this guy takes me to the back of that, and we he says we have to hurry. The, the lights are only going to come on for a few minutes. I was like, okay, okay. And so I follow this guy and we're we're rushing up these staircases and come out on the roof and we're running along the roof of the Goom department store. And and I'm thinking, this is nuts. This is like some <laughs> something out of a spy movie. And all of a sudden the lights just boom on they come and you know, red square lights up. And it's for me. <laughs> and you know, it's like Oh my god! And so he takes me right to the edge of the building, and and I'm there, and I'm taking all my my survey pictures, and and uh, he says, "Okay, now." And the lights go up, and we and we go back. But but this idea of running across the rooftops <laughs> in at Red Square was like, wow, that's not something that happens every day. Yeah, that's the power of film right there, and scouting. Um, yeah, but to answer to answer your question, the the, the actual filming was uh, was. Very, very interesting. We had we need we were tethering a bunch of hot air balloons that were coming from all over the world, all these fancy shaped things like the Mickey Mouse head uh, uh, balloon. And we wanted them at a certain level. Again, think of that lighthouse beam, right. you know, it's it's they've all got to be to a certain height. And to do that, they they have to be tethered to the ground. And so to hold down a hot air balloon, you need something heavy. And we got a bunch of Russian army trucks. And so we had this, this unit of the Russian army that was stationed just outside of uh, Moscow to come in and be our liaison. And, and they were the ones who were tying down the, the trucks, which you don't see in the shot. Um, but because they're down below the camera, cameras up on a cherry picker. Um, but uh, two weeks after we left was the attempted coup and um i'm trying to remember the name of uh boris what's his yeltsin. name who was the yeltsin thank you um he was encamped in the russian white house and he was protected by this same group of guys that we had been using in filming in the square they're the ones that protected him and uh very emotional working with these people. They're, the the Russians, for all their bluster, are just big softies. And you know, you know, it, it usually takes three or four vodkas. But by the time they get there, they're they're just you know, their their arm is over your shoulder and your tovarich and and you know, we're you know, we're lifelong buddies. You know that sort of thing. Let me ask you a little something about another unique uh, filmmaking medium that you are part of. Uh, and that is that you found yourself in 1996 writing and directing Noir, a shadowy thriller, which is a full motion video computer game. So for people who uh, might not be able to know what that is, um, imagine like a, a game where you would kind of point and click, kind of mist, where you can get stuff and, and move around a little bit at times. But incorporated into the majority of the video game is actual footage that has been shot already and sort of placed depending on your scenario or what you're doing or anything like that. How did you decide to tackle this kind of project? Uh, well, you're right in saying that it was very mist like in the interface. Um, I had, I had played mist and thoroughly enjoyed it. And I thought, you know, these guys, these brothers that, that did that went to an awful lot of work to make things like a tree or a building and, you know, but we have real buildings and real trees. Why, you know, why not a much more photographic based game? And so I came up with, uh, wrote this story, it takes place in 1939 in Los Angeles. It's a missing detective. And the, the premise of the, the game was that uh, you find yourself in this detective's office and he was working on six cases and they were all very, very different. One was about a, uh, the, a de the death of a, a racehorse. One was about a rare book. Um, another was about uh, a missing heiress and so on. 
And you have the opportunity to sort of take the place of this detective, and you're not going to find out what happened to him until you've solved all six cases. And I'm not, I, I'm, I don't need any spoiler alerts because I don't think there's a, there's still a gaming system out there. That <laughs> Maybe can play an emulator, this. who knows? But yeah, yes, that that's that's it exactly. But all six cases are in fact related. They're all really one case. Uh, and there's, you know, there's just no way anybody would ever guess that from the beginning. Um, so it was, uh, it was a lot of fun to reconstruct Los Angeles as it looked in um, that era, you know, 1939, 1940. Did, did you find that process different in some sort of way? I mean, did you have to think of multiple uh, sort of like uh, if the narrative is a tree and you have to shoot certain things, there are multiple branches depending on what people do or like, was that an easy process for you or, yeah. or was that a difficult sort of challenge? I'm sure there are ways to go about this um, that are much more efficient than the way <laughs> I did it. Um, it. You know, it was one of these things where I, I would just take a, you know, a sheet of paper and, and, and just start you know, drawing boxes and connections and, and, you know, basically saying, well, from here you can go to, you know, these different locations, but you need to have first been to this place, or you need to have found this item, or you need to have talked to this person. And I would start adding pieces of paper, just literally taping them on, you know, extending the page. And I think by the time I had, I'd mapped out the entire game it was maybe 16 pages hmm. it was you know it was it was this big thing that was on my wall um that was my reference um because it was very complicated to keep track of that stuff um so uh it uh, you know i i thoroughly enjoyed it i i enjoyed the logic of it i enjoyed the the you know the surprises the little easter eggs the all of the kinds of things that gamers um really relish and uh, it was fun you know and and again you know when when you come at it as a filmmaker you, you know you, you try to find surprises you try to find things to to entertain you know an audience in a linear fashion this is in a very much disjointed fashion and you still want it to be entertaining regardless of the path that they take to get to the end mm. So let's head on back to Epcot and to a show that you can still see uh, as of this recording when we're recording. Um, and that is, uh, of course, Reflections of China. So um, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, Reflections is also how uh, we sort of got in touch. Um, I uh, got in touch with you uh, because the show is closing and and I thought, geez, it's about time. Like this is going to be going away. And then just like Timekeeper, there's not going to be any sort of great reference. And But beyond just like having archival footage of it or anything of that nature, there's no place for um, the directors of these type of films, the uh, theme park films in general, to sort of like there's no DVD director's commentary. And I thought this would be a great thing to do. So I got in, in touch with you um, to do some uh, director's commentary for uh, a, a viewing of Reflections of China. And it, you were gracious enough to uh, help me out with that process. And, and, and that's going to be released. Um, my question is, and something you mentioned in the uh, commentary, is that your relationship with reflections is sort of based on the fact that Disney's marketing um, sort of forced your hand, I would say, um, into making some shifts and changes. What actually happened? Um, well, what happened initially was I, I got this, I, I was aware for years that, you know, because I'd go to events and there'd be Chinese people there that uh, um, had seen the film or, or, you know, were, in the government and and they'd say well when are you going to do an update when are you going to do an update and I, you know i heard this over and over and over again and and i was well aware that china had made enormous strides from the time that that i had made the first film and all of this stuff would go up the ladder to you know the head of the studios and and it would be up to them to make a decision as to when they were going to update it and the the decision was initially based on, well, if we find a sponsor, we'll do it. We don't want to spend the money to upgrade the film just on our own, which is what they did for the opening of Epcot. They just, you know, it was Disney's money and Disney's films. 
but it was more like, well, if we can get American Express interest in it or whatever, um, you know, maybe we'll we'll do that. Um, and so for years, the the upgrade just was on a shelf, just wasn't happening. When I finally get the call, they said, well, we're not going to update the whole film. We've just got some things that we want to replace. Oh, okay, fine. I'm I'm on board with that. And and so they invited me to, um, you know, basically go off on a survey with some studio executives, and uh, we would talk about the new material. And some of it was quite obvious. Well, we're gonna shoot Shanghai. I guess you know that's just you know spectacular now with the you know the the amazing architecture um so some things were quite obvious some were kind of painful scenes that that you know people were still wearing mao jackets Mm -hmm. you know uh from you know which was they were ubiquitous i mean that's all you saw in the streets were blue and gray mao jackets at the time that we were making wonders of china and we went to great lengths to you know, we did a scene on the Great Wall where we stripped an entire section of wall of of regular people and brought in a busload of people who were more naturally dressed, who wouldn't stare at the camera. And, you know, we, we so, you know, we redid that scene. So the 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 uh, the idea was to 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 both update in terms of where China is now and at the same time also fix things that were just sort of painfully out of date. So, okay, great. Those were the marching orders, went off, did a full survey, developed all my 360 pictures, and we were going to have this meeting on a Monday uh, with the executive, the higher ups at Walt Disney Imagineering to talk, to make a presentation. You know, this is, this is what we're going to do. And we had done all of this stuff the the previous week we had prepared we knew what we were going to do how we were going to replace this stuff and somebody casually mentioned that they wanted to disney wanted to promote the film as new and you know i was dumbfounded because the the we weren't going to replace the the first few minutes of the film there was not going to be anything new for, for like, you know, four or five minutes in. And I'm thinking, how, how do you promote a film as new if people are looking at it and, and, and they're watching scene after scene and they're going, well, this is the old film. What are you doing? So um, I, I found this out on a Friday and we were going to have this presentation on a Monday. And I went home and I took all my pictures and I had a breakdown of the original film, and I basically reorganized everything. It was like, uh, you know, everything was on a three by five card, so I could now reassemble and and put it all back together again. And the what I realized is was I needed one shot at the beginning, you know, that we hadn't surveyed, hadn't prepared for, but one new shot. And then everything else would work. It was the opening shot on the Great Wall with uh, Lee Po. And if we redid that or, or did a, a new scene for that, it would tie the rest of it together. And, uh, you know, the vast majority of the film would, if it wasn't new, it would feel new. And um, so, there's the, you know, there's a lot of new material in there. But it was, um, some of it was like, Really? You're going to call this new? Like, uh, as an example, uh, there's a scene that we did that was really, really hard to get, but it was a, a camel caravan out in the Gobi Desert. And it was it was uh, logistically, bureaucratically, it was a real nightmare to get this thing. But we finally, you know, here we are. We're in the Gobi Desert. We got the camera set up. We got the camel caravan. It was like action. And, you know, and they they march slowly. It, uh, from right to left and go over this hill and and that's it. It's like, okay, there you go. That was the shot. We finally got it. And it was like, okay, bring them back to, to one and we'll do a second take. And as they're coming back, I, I thought, oh, let's shoot this. Let's shoot it the other way. Then it gives me a choice in editing, you know, mm-hmm. going right to left or left to right. 
So I shot a second take going the other direction. And the one that we used in Wonders of China is the one where the camel car caravan is going from right to left. Well, in Reflections of China, they're going from left to right. <laughs> now, if you want to call that a new shot, it's like, well, it's new negative. It's take two instead of take one. But that's hardly the kind of thing that you, you know, the marketing people would be excited about. <laughs> but it, it has lasted a very long time. It's been fun to watch. So it works. Um, one of the things that's interesting, of course, uh, about doing the director's commentary with you is is I provided um, a 360. I went in. I, I I had a 360 camera, one of the GoPro uh, versions, and I stood dead center and and I and I captured it and then did a little bit of um, editing trickery to sort of take out some of the flicker and stuff like that. Um, but what I think is interesting is this is the first time that we've been able to archive Circle Vision uh, as close as yes. we can possibly get um, because before this, there's a lot of people putting cameras where they kind of think the action is or sort of shooting the way they think, well, whatever, but like, it's not really putting you in the moment. So what I'm curious though, is when you have technology that's 360, where I can take my phone and I can look at anything and, and I, I, you know, street view and all of this, what, what is the place of circle vision in a, in a world where the audience has 360, not even just 360 kind of horizontal, but 360 everywhere. What's the place of circle vision for an audience like that? Is it a medium that can still grow and change? Or does it have a, a, some sort of element uh, be, due to its nature of only showing you so much uh, that still makes it a, a medium worth pursuing? Um, the short answer is Yes. Um, and, and I would like to hope that it's not just because I've spent so much of my career making circle vision mm -hmm. movies that I that I say that. Um, one of the things that that I always liked about the process was you can only use this one particular lens on each camera. It's a 32 millimeter lens and it happens to simulate the uh, the same view as human vision. Um, in other words, it's a, it's a camera system that's designed that even though it's looking all the way around, what you're seeing and the perspective and and you know there there's there's in other words you could do it with with fewer cameras and wider lenses, but then you'd have a lot more distortion mm -hmm. in each of those images. But the way it was set up, it's it simulates a natural human vision of something. And so it it really comes down to the process that I was using and, and that I kind of came to on my own on, on, on Wonders of China, which is, am I standing right now in a place where I would like to invite millions of other people to also stand? That was how I would decide on a location. It wasn't just, you know, is, is it, you know, a, a picture from a book or is it a famous location or something like that? It was like once I w was zeroing in on it, it was, do I want to invite people to have the same view that I just had? Um, you know, I want to share that view <laughs> sometimes with, you know, 100 million people hmm. over time. And that is one of the things one of the hallmarks of, of circle vision and and so i would hope that it doesn't go away i know that you know they're doing a seamless version and um i honestly don't know what that's going to look like uh i've seen other um you know 360 seamless mm -hmm. presentations before um and it ultimately comes down to who's deciding where to put the camera mm -hmm. Not just the technology of, oh, yeah, but it's digital now, man. Or, you know, oh, it's high def. Yeah, but so what if it's not the right location? Mm. And, you know, that, that's what I think is, is, is key to that, that whole thing is that even, even when we were doing scenes with actors and stuff like that, and the, you know, the, where it was more, much more like dramatic filmmaking, it still came down to where you put the audience, where do they want to be? And, you know, there was another thing that, that you, that you kind of touched on there, which is this idea of being able to look in all directions. And one thing that, that a 
I, I got not so much from America the Beautiful, but from the process of making my own films, was that I wanted to control where an audience was looking. And that sounds like, you know, a contradiction of terms in circle vision. I can look any place. I can look at nine different screens, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I have total freedom. You're not, you know, locked into a chair. You're not forced to, to, you know, stand in one direction. You can look any place. So how do you control where an audience mm -hmm. looks? And there were a number of techniques that were developed uh, over the years that, that, you know, I found that were uh, very, very helpful in, in doing that. And, and it was in Wonders of China when you first meet Li Po. He, he, come, he fades in from out of history. He's walking in, on uh, panel number one. And he's talking to the audience directly. But he moves from one into uh, screen nine to screen eight to screen seven to screen six. And he's still talking to you. And basically, he grabs the audience and forces you to turn around and look behind you. And I wanted to do that right from the very beginning. It was one of my dreams of, uh, you know, in the first Circle Vision movie I made. I wanted to be able to say, hey, I can make you look where I want you to look. And, you know, the, because there were a lot of people who would watch America the Beautiful and they'd sort of be aimed at, you know, the front screens, for front couple of screens, and would occasionally sort of glance over their shoulder like, yeah, yeah, they're still running pictures back there in the back of the theater too. And it was like, what a waste. Mm -hmm. Why not make it a, a much more involving process, make it a more active experience for an audience. If you're going to invite 100 million people to stand on this hill, why not control where they look, what they see, how they mm -hmm. see it? So finishing up here, I'm curious, what, what keeps Jeff Blythe creative these days? What, what, what are you up to, uh, even if it's just for your own uh, sort of creative edge? Uh, well, I've been a writer for all my life, really. Um, I've, I've always written scripts. Um, I've had three scripts that have been made into uh, uh, thriller-type uh, TV movies. Um, I've got a feature script that is uh, in New Zealand at the moment, hoping to go into uh, production uh, when summer finally hits the Southern Hemisphere. Um, I've, I've written a couple of novels, nothing published, but I've just finished writing a memoir of the making of Wonders of China. And uh, I got a contract this afternoon from uh, Theme Park Press. Hey, there you go. Uh, there is so that's a start there in that direction. And I, I, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, you know, one of the things that I have always done is um, for more than 40 years, 40, well, let's see, starting in 79, um, I have kept a journal every day without fail of, you know, exactly what I was working on and what happened and mistakes made and triumphs and tragedies, everything. Uh, and that becomes a huge resource for me now, looking back, um, being able to reconstruct what I did on a particular film on any given day. So uh, that's that's what I'm I, I, I'm I'm doing at the moment and, and thoroughly enjoying it. Well, we will uh, we will be waiting for that book. I'm sure a lot of these listeners will be excited to read that. Jeff Lye, thank you so much for coming on Dreamfinders. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And that's it for this episode of Dreamfinders. Thanks so much to Jeff Blythe for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Dreamfinders is edited by Shannon Mickelson and quality control by Ben Harris. It's hosted and produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman, who you can follow on Twitter at Some Stuff I Said. Our podcast artwork is provided by J.P. Tanner. Find his other work at tanwoodcreative.com. This podcast is distributed by WDW News Today, the worldwide leader in Disney Parks news. Read all they have to offer at WDWNT.com. Tell your friends about the show, and please give us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It means a lot. Also, if you or someone else you know would make a great guest on this program, feel free to email us at dreamfinders at WDWNT.com. I'm Nathan Hartman, and remember, if we can dream it, then we can do it. DreamFinders is sponsored by Never Grow Up Vacations, the official travel partner of WDWNT.com. 
Never Grow Up Vacations specializes in trips to Disney destinations around the world. So be like us and never grow up. Head over to NeverGrowUpVacations.com to book your next trip today.